All right, all right. McLean Bible Church, it is good to be with you guys uh, this morning and open up God's Word with you. If you got a Bible, uh, meet me in uh, Psalm 27. Psalm 27, that's where we're going to be today. We are in the middle of a series called A Psalm for Everything. And if you don't know me, my name is Eric Saunders. Uh, I'm the location pastor over at our, lo- at our Arlington location. Shout out to NBC Arlington. Shout out to all of our locations. And also shout out to everyone who's watching us um, online this morning. And so, yeah, I appreciate that enthusiasm, y'all. And so uh, let's do this real quick. Uh, I'm going to read the text. Uh, I'm going to pray. And then we're going to reflect on how God is going to meet us from Psalm 27 today. Is that cool with you? Amen. All right, let's do it. Psalm 27, here it is. It says this. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Amen. Whom shall I fear? Amen. The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When evildoers assail me to eat up my flesh, my adversaries and foes, it is they who stumble and fall. Amen. Though an army encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though a war rise against me, yet I will be confident. Amen. One thing I have asked of the Lord that I will seek after, Amen. that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, yes. to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple, for he will hide me in his shelter in the day of trouble. He will conceal me under the cover of his tent. He will lift me high upon a rock. And now my head shall be lifted up above my enemies all around me. And I will offer in his tent sacrifices with shouts of joy. I will sing and make melody to the Lord. Hear, O Lord, when I cry aloud. Be gracious to me and answer me. You have said, seek my face. My heart says to you, your face, Lord, do I seek. Hide not your face from me. Turn not your servant away of anger. Yes. O oh, you who have been my help, cast me not off, forsake me not, O oh God of my salvation. Yes. For my father and my mother have forsaken me, but the Lord will take me in. Amen. Teach me your way, O oh Lord, and lead me on a level path because of my enemies. Give me not up to the will of my adversaries, for false witnesses have risen against me, and they breathe out violence. Yes. I believe that I shall look upon the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. And this is the word of God. Let's take a moment and pray together. Father, we are grateful for those who have trusted and believed in you for salvation, that we can open our lips and call you our Father. Father, I pray as we listen to your word today that we will respond to it in the way that we should, that we will respond in faith and obedience, and that we will believe you over and above what our fears tell us to believe. Father, will you help us today? You help us to lock in and listen, God. May you help us clear out distractions, clear out anxieties, God. And I pray that you will take these feeble words of mine and that you'll do something with them. God, not to us, not to us, but to your name be the glory. We love you. I pray these things in the name of Jesus. If you agree, say amen. Amen. So McLean Bible Church, I don't know if you know this. Uh, but we all have fears. You might not be willing to admit that. Some of the fears that we have are pretty common. I remember, I remember looking at a, at a common list of phobias. And let me give you a few. Sinophobia is the fear of dogs, fairly common. I, as a kid, I was bit by a dog, and for years, I was scared of your dog. I don't care if your dog is hyperallergenic. I don't care how nice your dog is. For years, I would say, keep your dog away from me. I, I get that. Uh, necrophobia. Necrophobia is the fear of dying. I get that. Glossophobia is the fear of public, public speaking, which incidentally ranked ahead of the fear of dying, meaning that you would rather die than do what I'm doing right now. 
And I know for many of you, listen, your fears don't rise to the level of phobia, but if you are a human, there is something out there that can cause fear in you. I don't know what that is, but I suspect that for most of you, your fear is understandable. I get it. Many of you fear being alone. Many of you fear losing a loved one. Many of you fear being unsuccessful. We all have fears, but what is interesting is this. The most common command in scripture is to command to fear not. And I used to always be confused by that command. How was God telling me not to fear when I'm in a situation that is fear inducing? Like if a lion ran out on the stage while I'm preaching, I don't know if I can control myself. But I've come to realize that when the Bible tells us to not be afraid, I don't think it's talking about the emotion of fear. What it's talking about is your devotion to fear. That's what it's talking about. It's interesting. Whenever the Bible has to tell someone to fear or not, they are already feeling the emotion of fear and the adrenaline of fear. However, what the Bible is trying to help us to, to, to determine is this. How will we respond to that feeling? When fear is on your doorsteps, when your palms are sweaty, when your heart is beating, when anxiety is rising, will you live a life that is a response to your fear or will you live a life that is a response to the presence of a holy God? That's the question that is before us. And in, in the year of our Lord, 2024, it seems like this year has already given us ample opportunity to answer that question. We have wars and rumors of wars all around us. We're already in the middle of a a presidential election season that has already been contentious. We have hurricanes moving up the East Coast. And that's not even mentioning the chaos that we experience uniquely in our personal lives. For many of us, we're experiencing the chaos of a hard relationship or a hard season or the unpredictable circumstances that often come. And for many of us in this world and even in the church, fear has been our response. Amen. The data actually bears this out, that despite here in the 21st century, all of our technological and social progress, fear and anxiety in our world has not decreased, it's increased. We live in a world in which social uh, media influencers and news outlets know that they can keep your attention if they, simply, if they simply keep you scared and angry. And this is the way that many of us are, including many of us who profess faith in Jesus Christ. So with all that said, here's my question. How do we take hold of peace in a world in which it seems like we have so much to fear? What does it mean for followers of Jesus Christ to project peace, to be a non-anxious presence when it feels like the world is going off the rails? I think Psalm 27 can actually help us here. Let me read verse one. It says, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? See, this text, it doesn't quite tell us specifically what situation that David is in, but we know that the situation he's in is fear-inducing. Why is that? Because he, ha- he has to actually say out loud, I'm not scared. He says, whom shall I fear? And if you're in any situation where you have to say out loud to somebody else or to yourself that I'm not scared, you're in a situation that is scary. And yet, in the midst of that, he says, the Lord is my light and my salvation. He says, the Lord is the stronghold of my life. And David, what he's doing is this. He's saying, listen, what I'm in, the situation that I'm in might be scary. However, what I'm going to do is I'm going to rehearse the character of God. That's what I'm going to do. In the darkness of my greatest fears, God, you bring light. In the danger of my greatest fears, God, you give salvation. And the insecurity of my greatest fears, God, you are a stronghold. And what I love about this text is not only does David uh, rehearse the, uh, uh, who God is, he also rehearses that this God is his. Amen. In the first verse alone, he uses the personal pronoun my three times. 
He says, you're my light when things get dark. You are my salvation when I'm in trouble. You are my stronghold when I am secure. And let me tell you this morning, if you are a child of God, the most beautiful thing that you can experience in this life is that the holy, omnipotent, all-loving, all-good God of the universe, that he is willing to allow you to call him mine. Amen. He's yours. But what I love about as this psalm continues is that David actually teaches us how to deal with fear. In order to deal with fear, as we continue through this psalm, here's one thing you got to do. In light of who God is, what we need to do is we we need to acknowledge our fears before God. We need to simply humbly and honestly acknowledge our fears before God. Listen. So many people deal with fears differently than how David deals with them in this psalm. How we typically deal with fear is what we do is we ignore our fears or what we do is we distract ourselves from our fears because we think that if we face our fears, we're going to automatically be overwhelmed by them. But David here, he, uh, he, he does something in verses two and three that seems counterintuitive. He demonstrates how we should deal with fear. David acknowledges his greatest fears before the Lord. Look at verses two and three. It says, when evildoers assail me to eat up my flesh, my adversaries and foes, it is they who stumble and fall. Though an army encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war arise against me, yet I will be confident. Now, now here's the thing. David went through situations like this, but it seems like this. David, in this psalm at least, he's not describing what has happened. He's describing what could happen. What he's doing is he's laying out before God his greatest fears. He's thinking about the worst thing that could happen to him. Evil doers eating my flesh. Sounds like a bad day. Even though a whole army, all these people against me, even if that happens. Later on, he actually names another fear in um, in, in, in verse 10. He says, even if my father and mother forsake me, even if I'm deserted. And and what he's doing here, he's doing something that we all need to do. One step in dealing with your fears is to simply honestly admit that you have them and naming them before the Lord. Y'all, what we need to do is this. We need to bring our specific fears to the light of day. And in doing so, you can know that if you are a child of God, there is nothing, absolutely nothing that you can name that can stop God from being your light, your salvation, your stronghold. Amen. So years ago, uh, my wife and I, and uh, we had one son at the time, uh, we were renting a place in Arlington that unbeknownst to us um, had an issue with mold. Man, we left for a week on vacation, had a good time. We came back on vacations high, and the whole house, as we opened the door, was covered in mold. So we're thinking, okay, cool, you're not going to ruin our joy. We're good. We got insurance. Nationwide is on our side. (laughs) And that's when we found out that typical renter's insurance policies don't cover mold. Man, the insurance company made this big deal about all the stuff it covered, but when it came to our greatest need in the moment, it didn't cover that. I'm not bitter at all. You can't tell. (laughs) See, our insurance company touted touted all the things that uh, it was supposed to protect us from, but when something very specific happened to us, it didn't protect us. You see, full coverage didn't mean full. Let me tell you today, that's not like God. When he claims to be your light, when he claims to be your salvation, when he claims to be your stronghold, he means this, that there is not a fear that you can name that he can't meet you there with his presence and his peace. He gives you full coverage. You may not be able to see how, but listen to me today, he's able. I want to be clear, in this text, David is not minimizing his fear. He's not saying that his fears are small. But what he's saying is this. He's saying, God, I'm going to fix my eyes on you because you are bigger than my fear. Let me tell you this, Josh. Listen, I found this true in my own life. It's not enough for me to generally say that I'm afraid. When I name my specific fears before God, God is faithful. He's able to provide specific comfort. So I want to invite you today to name your fears this morning. What do you fear? 
Many of you fear something happening to you. Many of you fear something bad happening to someone that you love dearly. Many of you fear having a certain experience or never having a certain experience of life. And let me tell you today, whatever your fear is, God is able to cover you in that and to give you comfort. But the first step, listen to me this morning, is for you to be honest. It's for you to be honest. And many of you never get to the point where you're actually able to be honest with God because you've run from fear so long that you just avoid it. Or you run from fear by simply calling it something else. So for many of you, you're fearful, but what you are telling yourself is is that you're angry. (laughs) And let me tell you this morning, that anger that you feel when you don't get your way is often the fear of not being in control. Your obsession with money, that's often the fear of losing security. You keep getting in bad relationships and you think that, oh man, it's just me making bad decisions. But here's the thing, at the bottom of it, for many of you, it's simply the fear of being alone. And for many of you, God just wants you to sit down with him and simply be honest about your fear so that he can fill you with the assurance that he won't fail you. Honesty is the first step. But it's not the only step. Let's keep going, look at verse four. It says, one thing I have asked of the Lord that I will seek after that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For he will hide me in his shelter in the day of trouble. He will conceal me under the cover of his tent. He will lift me high upon a rock and now my head shall be lifted up above my enemies all around me. And I will offer in his tent sacrifices with shouts of joy. I will sing to the Lord and make melody to the Lord. What's interesting about that part of the text is when I first read it, I thought that David was changing the subject. Like he's talking about his fears in the first three verses. And then he starts talking about something different. But what I love about this text is that David actually isn't changing the subject. He's actually teaching us how to deal with our fear. So first we need to acknowledge our fear, but then we deal with fear by gazing at the beauty of God. We acknowledge our fear, but then we gaze at the beauty of God. This is how, listen to me, this is how we as followers of Jesus Christ, if you trust it and believe in him, this is how we become people of peace in a world of chaos. Just to give a brief analogy, man, this made me think about my first summer job. I was 16 years old, and I was tired of a response that I, would, that I would often get from my mother. Whenever I would ask, Mom, can we go to McDonald's, she would always ask me the same question. Do you have McDonald's money? And so what I needed to do is go make my own money. And so I said, 16 years old, I'm going to get a job. I worked as a, as a summer camp I'm counselor, and I thought, this is easy work. I can watch kids for a couple of hours. I get paid easy money. I was wrong. Absolutely wrong. I was in for a rude awakening. Why? Because the kids, out of the kids that I was responsible before, there was a kid named Dez, and uh, Dez was a ringleader, but not, a good, not in a good way. My man Dez was all over the place, easily distracted, no self-control whatsoever. And typically when my group descended into chaos, Dez was in the middle of it all. And this is why I was so shocked. One day near the end of the day, my group of kids once again descended into chaos and I looked around at all of them and Des, surprisingly, was the most well-behaved kid in the classroom. My guy was sitting there, crisscrossed applesauce on the floor and I'm astounded, I'm shocked, I'm wondering why. And then I turned around and I realized it. His mom was at the door. Y'all, I was so shocked in that moment because I thought the only response that Dez could ever possibly have to chaos around him was for him to participate in it. But Dez was able to be still in complete chaos, catch this, because of the presence of his mother. And I'm here to tell you that if you are a child of God, your peace actually comes in a similar way. If you're a child of God this morning, hear me today, fear is not the only response that you need to have to the chaos around you. It's not. Why is that? Because a good, all-powerful, all-present God is among us this morning. He's here. And he's inviting us to gaze at his beauty. Verse 7 actually says that he's inviting us to seek his face. And listen, 
When we gaze at his beauty, when we seek his face in the middle of chaos, fear no longer has to be our response. We can be still and know that he is God. So the question we should have this morning is, how do, what does it mean to gaze at the beauty of God when we can't see God? My kid asked me that question last week. I was reading a story uh, to him out of our little story uh, Bible, and I was talking to him about how we should love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And that kid, that, that uh, theologian eight-year-old looked back at me, and he says, how do I love God with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength when I can't see him? And I'm telling you, man, I, I, I like theology, but listen, man, these little kids, man, they will test your theology. <laughs> but I want to answer you in the way that I attempted to answer him. One of the ways that we gaze at the beauty of God is when we meditate on who God has revealed himself to be rather than our fears in the moment. So when we open up our, our, our Bibles, the 66 books that we have right here, and we peer into them and we see how God has revealed himself and we say that this God is my God and I'm going to choose my, to live my life and respond to his presence rather than my fears. So let's bring it home to us. We see so much chaos and fear in the world right now. And when, and, and when fear bubbles up in us because of the chaos and the, and, and the unrest in our world, that is a good um, opportunity for us to be reminded of Psalm 46 and the beauty of God's power. Psalm 46 talks about how God is able to make war cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow, he shatters the spear, he burns the chariot with fire. And if God has that power, we can trust him. Not only that, when we see the chaos around us because of this election year and it causes our chest to tighten, we can remember his word in Daniel 2 that describes the beauty of God's authority. Daniel 2, I don't know if you know that passage, it says that God, that he sets up kings and he, and he throws them down as well. That nothing happens, that there are no elected officials that take their place outside of the sovereignty and the providence of God. And you know what we can do? We can trust him. Yes. When chaos in your life causes anxiety to well up in you, that's also an opportunity for you to open up this Bible and for you to remember the beauty of his presence. We recite Matthew 28 every single week where Jesus says, I will be with you always, even to the end of the age. McLean Bible Church, God invites you to meditate on his beauty rather than your fears. However, hear me this morning, for some of you, you can't gaze on the beauty of God because of the ugliness of your sin. And let me tell you this morning that God has made a way for you to see his beauty through the person and work of his son, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ came and he lived a sinless life in full obedience to his father. We deserve Hell, we deserted eternal separation from God because of our sin, and yet Jesus came, lived a perfect life, died a death in our place on the cross for our sins, absorbing the wrath of God. He rose again, proving that he is powerful over sin, sin, and death of the grave, meaning this, when you trust and believe in him, you can have eternal life, and fear no longer has to final say over your life. What a great God that we serve. However, for many of you, you've actually made that decision, but your life is still characterized by fear. And let me tell you what often the problem is. The issue is this. This scripture tells us we need to gaze at the beauty of God, but what we often do is we gaze at our fears and we only glimpse at his beauty. We often gaze at our fears, we only glimpse at his beauty. We spend life in this world, the other six days of the week, picking up fear after fear after fear in our social media feeds, in our news outlets, and all around, and the people all around us. And we come here to church, and for an hour and a half, all we do is glimpse. And God actually wants to switch that. Amen. Here in this morning, gazing at the beauty of God actually takes intentionality. Let me challenge you this morning, McLean Bible Church. God is omnipresent. He is closer to you right now than, his very, than your very breath. God is available to you, but hear me today, God will not force himself upon you. He won't. And for many of you, the reason why you only glimpse at the beauty of God is because of your speed of life. 
You only have time to glimpse at the beauty of God rather than gaze at it. And we wonder why fear cripples us. Your fear right now, hear me today, it may be the alarm that God desires to use to cause you to slow down, to schedule time with him, to meditate on his character, and to seek his face. For many of us, what we need is a slowed down spirituality where throughout the day we are meditating on the goodness of God even in the midst of a world of fear. Amen. But not only must we gaze at, a, at the beauty of God, we must also do this, y'all. And we see this in the rest of the psalm. We also need to deal with fear by remembering the promises of God. We need to remember the great and precious promises of God. What I love about the psalm is this. In verse 7, the psalm actually changes. Verses 1 through 6, David is actually talking about God. Verses 7 through the end of the chapter, uh, David is actually talking to God. And we see David praying in the next few verses. Verse 7, it says, Hear, O Lord, when I cry out to you, be gracious to me and answer me. You have said, seek my face. My heart says to you, your face, Lord, do I seek. Hide not your face from me. Turn not your anger away, your, your, your servant away in anger. O oh, you who have been my help, cast me not off, forsake me not, O God of my salvation. For my father and my mother have forsaken me, but the Lord will take me in. Teach me your way, O Lord, and lead me on a level path because of my enemies. Give me not up to the will of my adversaries, for false witnesses have risen against me, and they breathe out violence." Thinking about that um, part of the chapter, I don't know if you've ever um, played the game whack-a-mole. You see this in a whole bunch of arcades, right? So to give you a picture, um, whack-a-mole is a game where you hold a mallet, there's all these holes right in front of you, and whatever pops out of the hole, you have to hit it back with the mallet that you are holding. And I I thought about that game because I really think that that's what David is playing here. That's what David is doing here. His fears are popping up, and what he's doing is he's beating his fears back by the gift of praying the promises of God. Amen. You may think, how do I seek God in the midst of fears? Well, David here, he demonstrates that one of the ways that you seek God is through the gift of prayer. If I had to summarize verses 7 through 12, this is what David is doing. Verse 7, God, I'm scared. I need your voice. Answer me. Verse 8, God, I'm scared. I need your presence. Verse 9, God, I'm scared. Will you help me? Verse 10, God, I'm scared. Teach me or or take me in. Verse 11, I'm scared, God, will you teach me? Verse 12, God, I'm scared. Will you protect me? And what he's doing in in the midst of these fears, he's calling God to be who he's promised to be. And listen, every time that we fear, we have got to return to the promises of God. That's the only way that we're going to have stability in fearful times. And here's the thing. The reason why we need to uh, return to the promises of God about our future is because our fears actually make promises about the future too. You know what your fears promise you? Your fears promise that if your fear is realized, that you'll never recover. That's what your fears say to you. Your fears often say to you, the reason why your fears are your greatest fears is because you think that you'll never recover from losing that person, that you'll never recover from losing your health, that you'll never recover from being alone. Your fears promise that if that one thing happens, your life is over. But I want you to look at verse 13. Because David says, listen, I'm not going to listen to my fears. I'm going to listen to the promises of God. And what happens for him is hope. Verse 13, it says, I believe that I shall look upon the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. See, what David is saying here is this. He says, listen, regardless of all this chaos, I know that there are good things ahead of me. Why? Because the same God that delivered me in the past is with me now in the present. And because God is with David now, David is able to say, listen, I know that joy and goodness aren't simply a distant memory of the past. It's also a future reality for me as well. Hear me today. The reason why your fears are debilitating today is because this, you can't imagine goodness meeting you on the other side of your greatest fear. If your greatest fear happens, if you lose your livelihood, 
If you lose that person, if you lose that dream, you believe that your story is over, that it is a tragedy. But the God of heaven says this, stop letting your fears tell you when your story is over. God determines where your story goes. He's leading his children somewhere good, even if he needs to lead you through the dark. Y'all, I remember for the first time being introduced to the concept of a post-credit scene. This was the 90s. I was a teenager, and I remember going to a movie, telling a friend of mine that I'm going to see this movie, and he looked at me, and he told me, listen, you got to stay after the credits. I know you're tempted to get up and leave when the theater gets dark, but trust me, you got to stay. Like, you're going to be glad you did. Everybody's going to get up. You stay there. Wait. There's something good waiting for you. So I said, okay, bet. So I go and I watch the movie. And sure enough, at the end of the movie, as it always does, the theater gets dark and the credits roll. People around me start to leave and pick up their belongings. And that would have been me too, but my boy, he told me to stay. And so I wait there in the darkness. All these names. I wait, I wait, and I wait. And then it happened. The story continued. And it it, it was amazing. And I love how that post credit scene taught me about how God deals with us even in the midst of a life of fear. For children of God, David is telling us something similar. Darkness is not the end of the story. There's a post credit scene. Your life actually might get dark. It may feel like it's over, but there is more to the story left to go, and it is better than you can imagine. Do you have the faith to wait? David believed this. In this psalm, he names his greatest fears. He names his greatest fears before the Lord. He gazes at the beauty of God. He prays the promises of God down into his fears, and then he determines to wake. He says, I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. What he's declaring is this, is that no matter what his fears are, he is confident that his story is not over, that there is goodness on the other side of his greatest fears. Hear me today, you could be confident of this too. Your story is not over even if your greatest fear is realized. Like even the darkness of death can't stop God from bringing you his goodness. How do we know that? Look at the cross. The cross is a beautiful picture because here's the thing. There is nothing more fearful and dark than what happened to Jesus at Calvary. Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins, but he didn't just die. He bore the wrath that we deserve as punishment for our sins. He took upon himself the punishment that we deserve, experiencing the full wrath of a holy God. And Hebrews 10, 31 tells us that it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And that's exactly what happened to Jesus. And Jesus did all of this for you. The most fearful thing, the, 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 the most horrifying thing, death, Jesus experienced that for you. He died, and for so many people, they thought that that was when the story was over. <laughs> but I love this old song that um, my old independent Baptist church used to sing. They used to sing this song, and that's not how the story ends, but three days later, he rose again. Jesus rose in all power. Proven that he's God and that he's victorious over sin, Satan, death, and the grave. And he sits right now at the throne of his father forever and interceding for you. Proving this, that it is not over when your fear says it's over. I'll put it simply. If there is life and goodness on the other side of the cross... You can know that there is life and goodness on the other side of whatever fear that you can name before the Lord. You don't have to be enslaved by your fears this morning. You don't. My question for you today is, do you trust him? You may be in a hard season right now. It may be scary. But I want to call you to wait on the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Wait on the Lord. This is what I want us to do. I want us to take some time in silence to simply express our fears before the Lord. For many of you, you hesitate to do this. You haven't done this. 
but it is good and wise for us to simply be honest with God about our fears. So let's, let's cast our concerns on him, knowing that he cares for us. And in doing so, let's ask God for the strength to respond to his presence rather than our fears. Let's take a moment. In the silence of this moment, let's lift our fears to God and let's trust that he will be our light, our salvation, our stronghold. Let's do that now. Or either, and then either I or someone at your location will close out this time. Father, I pray for everyone under the sound of my voice. I pray that we would cast our anxieties on you because you care for us and that you promise to meet us right where we are in the midst of our fears because of the finished work of your son, Jesus Christ. You promise to be our light, our salvation, our stronghold. So God, will you teach us to trust you and would you teach us to demonstrate our trust in the way that we respond to the common fears that we come up against? Father, I pray that we'll be a people who do not live in the same way that the world does. Father, I pray, God, when we hear of wars and rumors of wars all, all around the world, when we're nervous about the direction of our country, when we're nervous about things that can happen even personally to us, I pray that our response is not the hand wringing that we see all around us, but that you will grant us supernatural peace because you are for us and not against us. You are not far off away, but you are with us. So Father, will you help us? We need you. And I pray as your people demonstrate a peace that passes all understanding, that our world, with all of its anxiety and fear, will peer into the church and say, how are you able to be so peaceful in times like this? And we're able to point to you. Father, help us. We need you. I pray these things in the name of Jesus. If you agree, say amen. amen.